thank you everyone for joining. This is our third day. I think at one point I might lose count, but it's <laughs> still relatively early. Um, this is our third day of live sessions for Rebels and Rulers. And I repeat this every time, but as some of you might know, we've decided to do an entire month dedicated to open branding with uh, some daily doses of insights and you know, topics of conversation and just great, great people that we've met along the way um, every day uh, in lieu of obviously what we what we cannot do in the in the physical world, given given certain conditions. So I thank you everyone for joining. It's been very humbling to see how how many people have are, are kind of tagging along for the journey. Um, today, we're continuing our live sessions with Matt. And he's, an ex first of all, an extraordinary guy. Um, definitely, definitely one for the books. He's also an 88 time line winner. Um, he was creative marketer of the year, which was well-deserved. And he's also founder of his own, his own consulting company called MB Brand Consulting. So welcome, Matt. Thank you for joining me. Hello, Flavia. Thanks for having me. We're obviously also very good friends, <laughs> as you can tell, but, um, I have my questions as always prepared for Matt, but uh, I do invite everybody to submit your questions either through the Q&A function here on Zoom or on Facebook, on the chat. Uh, I will be looking at them throughout. I will you know, bring them in whenever I can. So definitely don't keep them for the end, just shoot them on over and I'll, I'll do my best to pull them into the conversation. So with that, I think we can get started. Um, and given what we were talking about, uh, what we were talking about before, and, and recently, I think I'm going to let Matt start by kind of telling us what his opinion is on these uncertain times. And I'm using air quotes because, well, you'll see why once he once he explains. So, yeah. So uh, thanks, and you know, and thanks for having me. You know, um, we first met a couple years ago in the beautiful city of Bucharest. Uh, you invited me and some amazing speakers to rebels and rulers and um, anyone who's watching this who hasn't had a chance to go to Bucharest, I would encourage you because it's just a gorgeous city. And if Flavia can be your host, even better. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think a couple, a couple of things. One, in your introduction, you said that I am an 88 time lion winner and that I was the marketer of the year at Cannes. My computer wants to back up. I'll tell it not to. Um, <laughs> I, I, that's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, I, I certainly led um, a group of people from around the world that did this win is true. 88 lions. Yes, In my this view, is true. Nobody wins a lion. You, um, you can inspire people to win them. And it takes a village. That's number one. Number two, um, I worked at McDonald's at the time. I was the global brand lead at McDonald's and McDonald's the creative marketer of the year. I uh, got a lot of credit for that and I had a lot to do with it, making that happen. But I think just in fairness to the thousands of people that um, truly won that award, just want to give credit where credit is due. So there's that. Fair um, point, fair point. I thought it would be important to just remind ourselves um, What's going on in the world today? And, and as we talk about storytelling and brand and creativity, I think you need to put it into the right kind of context. And I was saying to Flavi before we started, I'm, I'm really tired of hearing news people talking about uncertain times because the times are very certain. We, we, we know what's happening. We are in the midst of a pandemic. There is economic hardship across the globe. Racism has raised its ugly head and the world is struggling and certainly Americans are struggling with it in ways that we couldn't have imagined before. Um, political tensions are pulling people apart. Again, in American view, uh, we couldn't be more, more split. Um, the climate um, and then probably underlying all that is this lack of trust and we see a lack of trust with politicians, with governments, with the media, that leaves a vacuum for brands to step in. Mm -hmm. And so I think as we think about this pandemic and all these other horrible things, maybe it's a signal that it's time for us to get off the hamster wheels 
and pause and think about what's really important to us personally, to our families, to our communities. And then of course, to think about, so what should brands be doing a little bit differently? So I think it was important just to kind of frame up why we're even talking in this environment versus you know, being back in Bucharest and in front of a large audience. So um, it would be helpful to kind of set that stage. No, I, I completely agree. And I think one of the things that we were focusing on at Rebels and Rulers in, in both years, in, um, in the one that you were at and, and, and the other, it was this idea that, you know, in some cases, brands have shown that they're able to do what governments cannot. And, uh, you know, maybe here we come from a country that, uh, let's say, hasn't had as much trust in the government as in others. I think America is a very different story. But for us, it was very important to try to instill this knowledge and show and show through the speakers what the principles of brand strategy can actually do when applied to not just companies, but people, communities, countries, etc. So I definitely I definitely agree that there's something there. I wish it wouldn't take such hardship for for that to be the case. But, you know, sometimes with great strife comes great opportunity. So sure. So given, given that, um, and I think that since you touched on the idea of, of politics, I know that it is something of, of an interest for you. And I'm, and I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if there's, if you see how you see branding related to the political world. I mean, are there things that we can learn from what happened these few months in, in the US that can, that we can apply um, in our industry and in our day-to-day -day jobs, just because of, you know, the fact that the parallel is there. This is how people function. This is how society is functioning, etc. Is there something we can we can garner from that? I think so. You know, it's, and again, um, I live in Chicago, so I'm gonna. I, I have an American view of of the political world, and you know, I, and I know the world pays attention to our politics much more than America pays pays attention to the politics around the world. Um, uh, what I've seen is that this, the only time where people in America agree that advertising is good and effective and makes a difference is during elections. Mm -hmm. When um, one candidate is doing better than the other, the news media talks about the fact that they have more advertising dollars to spend. And today that they're using Facebook and Google algorithms better than they ever have before. But when you ask the general public, does advertising work? then you get all the reasons that they say, no, it doesn't work. So I think it, one, one, for all of us who are in the marketing ecosystem, it's proof positive that with the right pressure, the right message, the right people at the right time, that we can truly um, shift how people see um, a candidate. And the candidate is nothing more, in my view, than a brand. Mm -hmm. um, I look at what uh, Donald Trump has been able to do. And one, love him or hate him, the, that individual has been extremely agonizingly consistent on what his brand position is. He wants to make America great again. And he has repeated that mantra for now the better part of five years. And what do you know? People now see Donald Trump as a fraction of people see Donald Trump as the person who's going to make America great again. Mm -hmm. um, he's also brilliant at message management and, and managing the news cycle. Um, the opposite side of the aisle will say to a fault, but he is brilliant at finding messages to deliver and understanding his audience better than anyone else I've ever seen. He, he seems to have his finger on insights about his base that um, others don't. So as a look, think about it as a brand, you know, we've talked you know, for decades about the power of insights. Today, we say we need data. The world is swimming in data. The world is starving for insights. And I think the political world has done a really good job of, of being clear about what they stand for. And probably as much as anything, they've leaned on uh, brand personality um, mm -hmm. in a very big way. You know, if, if you ask 
most casual observers of the last presidential election, what are the tangible differences between Joe Biden and Donald Trump? People can name one or two. But if you start saying, so talk to me about their personalities, talk to me about their character, talk about what their essence is, you'll see vast differences. And so I think as brands, um, we often overlook the power of how to differentiate sheerly through the power of character and personality. So I think that for me was, was one of the, the key learnings of, um, of this past election. And if I think back to other elections in, in different parts of the world, you know, personality, uh, that intangible part of the brand um, truly can differentiate in a way that those more tangible aspects don't. Hmm. I like this. It's it's uh, this intangible nature is coming up quite a bit, and and I know that uh, I know that you were there for Rob's discussion a couple of days ago, and he was talking about how you know every detail is part of the story. So um, I'm going to ask you now. You know, what do you believe a brand to be in the context of an entire organization? Um, how would you how would you describe it? We we keep saying that it's still a relatively misunderstood misunderstood term especially when you step outside of let's say western civilization i think it's even more so so i'd love to hear from you how you how you see it yeah um i think uh the the brand you know all the brand experts around the world have done our very best to confuse people all around the world <laughs> about this topic you know, if you were in the, uh, the, in, the in accounting and, and you, you, could, you could be an accountant and walk into any CFO's office and you would use the exact same language for the exact same. Mm -hmm. In the brand space, we make up all of these terms that we think are proprietary. You've got brand strategy and position and purpose and ethos and driver, all these things. And none of us even know what we're talking about. Yeah. But I think... Um, I think brand is simply a promise of quality that meets consumer expectations. I think the only reason that you want to have a powerful brand is to drive commerce. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why you have one. Um, you know, all the co comments about being shorthand for helping people make decisions all still, you know, very true. But um, I think in the world today that, you know, brands need to truly stand for something, something meaningful and something memorable. And they need to uh, repeat that everywhere they can. M more and more we're looking at uh, brand experience. Mm -hmm. when, when, uh, when I first got into uh, this business, I thought, man, the you know, brand strategy is a sacrosanct thing and it's everything. And what I realized over a number of years is that really everything is the brand. You know, ev mm -hmm. Every touch point, every interaction, every customer service call, every ad, every uniform on an employee, every, everything is the brand. And the ones that are being more successful are more intentional about telling that story across all these little chapters. Um, and I think importantly, doing it in a way that gives the people who are driving all that freedom. Because hmm. freedom drives creativity and innovation and that's what truly differentiates one offering from the other. And, and it starts with really being clear about why you matter, what do you stand for, how do you do what you do, for whom, within what context. And um, those principles um, you know, I've learned after a long time you know, are timeless. And yeah. whether you're in a pre-COVID world, a COVID world, a post-COVID world, whatever else the world looks like afterwards, um, being clear about who you are gives you that true north. So given, given, given what you're saying and all the teams that you've led, how do you, how do you lessen the tension then of wanting, you know, teams and employees and everybody internally to kind of stick to the brand, which is always this, you know, uh, being on brand can feel a little bit confining. 
um, yet also give them the freedom to do, you know, to do them, to be, be themselves. You know, you say freedom, but I think when we think about how to apply brand internally, it can feel confining or, you know, you sit there and you make structures and guidelines and things like this and frameworks. And so how do you, how do you think about that tension or how have you resolved it, to be honest, given all the experience that you have? Um, you know, when I was, uh, when I spoke in, in Bucharest, I talked about the 10 principles to giving brands charisma. Mm -hmm. charisma if you look at the dictionary in English, it's, it means to give, it, it's to exercise a sense of charm that inspires devotion. And, and, and one of those principles was about commitment. And, and, and that's being committed to a direction for the brand and being committed and resource the socializing of that across a vast organization. So just a little story. So when, when I first joined McDonald's in 2005, I thought they had a really clear idea of what they stood for as a brand. And the notion was that McDonald's, this is all out in the public, so it's not some secret. Uh, the, 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 the spirit of the brand was forever young. Hmm. And I loved that. I thought, oh, that's, that's about the heritage and the longevity and the history, but also this sort of youthful optimism, this always looking for something new, always growing, always changing. And the combination of those two, forever and young, was what um, the brand was about. And the, the marketing ecosystem at McDonald's, which was thousands of people and the agencies all got that. So as a marketing direction, it was, it was really good, but nobody else understood what that meant around the company. And so what I learned was the power of alignment within organizations is critical to success and getting it is really hard. So fast forward a little bit of time later and I was meeting with all the creative leaderships uh, leaders rather of, uh, of McDonald's agencies. And we got into a pretty heated debate about what the brand should stand for. And a guy from uh, Leo Burnett in London stood up in the meeting and he screamed across the table, you don't know what you stand for. And if you could just figure that out, we could do the kind of advertising that you want us to do. And um, he was right. And so we, we pursued uh, an initiative to more clearly define what the McDonald's brand stood for. And I remember uh, needing to get the support of Jim Skinner, who was the CEO at the time. And Jim was yeah. a really wonderful leader, but kind of a curmudgeon. And uh, Jim, Jim said to me, well, I, I know what the brand stands for. I don't even know why you need to do this. I said, I know you know what it stands for, Jim, but you want everybody to know. You want everyone to, to have the same common understanding, a shared language about what we stand for and why we matter. And so we, we, we went down that path. That was hard to do. But the really challenging part was um, to cascade it, to have a crew person in a restaurant to understand what the brand should stand for, understand what they were supposed to be doing differently and what they should be doing more of. Um, and companies get bored so fast. So you, you really need to, this isn't about reinventing who you are. Yeah. This in our case was about digging deep about who we truly were. And we went back to the ethos of the founder, Ray Kroc, uh, and looked at what Ray wanted. And what Ray wanted was a brand that was simple, that was easy, and that was enjoyable. And that was the brand proposition. And so then it became, how do you then cascade that and get people to support it? But they all got it because it was true. So if a long-winded way of saying, you know, when you're thinking about brand direction, uh, rule number one it has to be true. It has to be authentic to who you really are. Otherwise, hmm. it, uh, it will not last and your customer base will not connect with it. So then, so then can I ask you who you believe like, where does the brand sit then in an organization? Who is responsible for it from a, from a role standpoint? Because I think this is also a topic of tension recently. It's been, it's been a little bit, you know, some people say it's marketing. Some people say it's now it's going up to higher leadership, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you think? Well, it's it sort of, the answer is yes. 
Um, you know, the, the uh, but, but you know, there's, and there's different- Everybody, of, it's everybody's you know, responsibility. Well, you know what? It is. Yeah. Um, so think about this, uh, you know, for, just to answer your question simply. Yeah. The CEO of the company is the chief brand champion. Um, Correct. It is a business asset. It is an asset to drive the business. And if you're clear about the strategy, it drives resource allocation mm -hmm. and it dr drives behavior. So the idea that the a chief marketing officer is responsible for the brand is a very dated way of thinking about it because brand is not about only what you communicate because everything communicates. Supply yeah. chain communicates, HR communicates. In a retail environment, the people in the stores communicate. Mm -hmm. So the CEO's role is critical to say that this is important. And of course the CEO will then delegate to some individual, whether it's a chief brand officer, it's COO, whoever the title is, um, but it's everybody's responsibility. Um, and, and the companies that I've seen who do that, the employee, it's about employee engagement as well, employee satisfaction and feeling like they own the, and they're responsible for the relationship and part of the story of the brand. And I think, you know, uh, reducing attrition in companies is important and empowering people with purpose um, can go a long way to help that. Hmm. I'm thinking that, you know, actually, well, now I'm just curious, do your, are your clients getting this? Do they get it when you explain it to them? Because I think it's, you know, it's one thing to hear it and say, yeah, sure, I understand. But to apply it is just a whole nother, a whole nother level that I feel is still a little bit muddy sometimes. Yeah, I, think I think it goes back to your first question about how we confuse people about what brand is. And um, I, can, I, was, I was brought on by a, a startup to um, get more clear about what they should stand for. Why do they matter? What do they stand for? And we went through a process to get that. And, and they were a little reluctant. They were like, well, why, why do we need to do this? I said, well, it's very simple to me. Y you are trying to attract customers. The more clear and focused you can be with limited resources, the more you'll attract customers. You're also trying to attract investors. Mm -hmm. Investors want to know that you know what your business is, but what they're investing is, is a brand. And so if you are clear, if you can go into the investor and say, this is what we sell, this is what we do, and this is who we are, that's well above just what we sell. You hear this from, from VCs all the time, is that, that they wish their portfolio companies had focused as much on their brand as they do on their product. Mm -hmm. now, I think that's taken a little bit too extreme because if you don't have a product, there, there is no brand. But, but it's this notion that brand, you know, you, you were talking you know, to Laura about this as well. You know, brand is about the business. Brand is about direction. Brand is an aligner. And, and I've, I've always thought that brand was important from a consumer perspective, but boy, internally, especially in big companies, that level of alignment creates power hmm. and uh, it's important. I love that. And somebody is actually asking if you have any good examples of where companies have done this across supply chain, employee experience, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, there's the obvious ones that everybody uses because they're, they're so good at it. Um, you know, the, you know, Apple does an amazing job. Um, yeah, true. You know, Nike does an amazing job. Google is doing an amazing job at this. Um, I, I don't know whether they're taking it all the way through uh, to supply chain, but I think of, of a brand like Uber who has taken a clear stand of what they're all about and it permeates. I think I'm wearing uh, glasses from Warby Parker. Mm -hmm. you know, their story is very clear and compelling and they print it on every one of the little you know, cloth things that they give every customer to clean their glasses. They tell their story. And 
<laughs> that focus that they have on beauty and design and functionality and value, it plays out whether you're wearing, physically wearing the glasses, whether you're going to a retail shop, whether you see the books that they sell, they sell books in their retail stores that are all about leadership and design and technology. And, um, and then when you go to their online experience, you know, the same thing, the sort of effortless access to design, uh, it permeates. Hmm. I'm sure, there, I'm sure people, there, there's others that I just can't think of off the top of my head. Yeah, no worries. So, um, let's go back. Cause you mentioned, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned just a bit, the, the principles that you talked about in your talk at Rebels and Rulers and, I think regardless of regardless of whether people have had a chance to watch the video or not yesterday I think it I think it would be uh, it would be interesting to hear if you feel that those principles kind of are still holding true in in a world of crisis or maybe some more than others or have you been surprised at all um, by how let's say storytelling has has shifted in those ways Yeah well so so first the um, the 10 principles were uh, 10 principles that I picked up along the way that I think I learned the hard way. And I, when you asked me to come and talk, I thought it would be worth sharing to that audience things that I learned, you know, it took me a long time to learn so they didn't have to spend so much time learning. Uh, and so the 10 that's, were- you know, That's the goal. <laughs> you, know, that, that, you know, number one was you had to be committed. So this is about, uh, building brand charisma through powerful marketing communications. And mm -hmm. so one was commitment that you have to truly be committed to a culture of creativity if you want to drive that in the business. And that has to be well beyond just the marketing department. And what I learned is if you want the business to support it, then you need to drive home what the business purpose is of doing great advertising. Um, the second one was around brand. We've been talking about that, that charismatic brands are clear about what they stand for, why they matter, cascades through the company. Everybody knows what the message is. Everybody on the same page. You got to have that. Um, number three was around leadership. That is, if you're trying to, again, create this culture of creativity, there needs to be um, an arrow that's pushing this forward. In the case of the companies that I work for, McDonald's, Visa, Olympics, and others, you know, I was that person that was driving it, which is why I said I didn't win 88 Lions. I, was, I just yeah. pushed it. Um, so leadership is important. Um, relationships, um, no matter how much technology we bring into the process, which is amazing, and we're doing, you know, people are doing amazing things with technology, Relationships in the companies are important. Relationships with your peers, with your staff, with your agencies, vendors, all of that is, in, is important. Um, I, I listened to a, a leader at Salesforce who I thought did an amazing job building relationships with her employees. And she says, for every single employee that works for me, and that was hundreds, she goes, I, I know what drives their soul and I know what they do for their salary. And my job is, is to find more stuff for them to do that fuels their soul. Because I know they're going to have to do that salary stuff too. So that, you know, relationships are hmm. truly How important. nice. Yeah, I thought that was lovely. Yeah. Um, I have a, uh, the, the fifth one was around what I call the three P's, people, process, and precision. You got to have the right people, the right strategic precision, and the right process. And in today's world, because we're moving at such a pace, that process even more important. You need to train people. You need to have a common language. Um, Milton Glaser, who was the, uh, the, the designer who designed the I Love New York symbol mm -hmm. you know, decades ago, said there's only three ways to look at creative ideas. He said, yes, no, and wow. And uh, I've always loved that. And I think whether you use yes, no, wow, or something else, having a common language to agree on from a marketing communication standpoint, like what's great, what's good, and what's terrible. I'd be mm -hmm. all around that. Uh, celebrating victories. Um, we spend a lot of time saying what's wrong. We should celebrate those wins, those 88 lines. We had lots of good parties around those 88. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I'm but, a big fan of this one, actually, celebrating um, victories. You, you asked earlier about brand and how to keep it going. One of the ways I think is you always have to plan your next act. 
always need to be looking at, at how do you make it stronger, fresher, more relevant because companies get bored. So always getting ahead of it and planning the next act. I'd say when, when Steve Easterbrook, who was the CEO of McDonald's, when we became the marketer of the year at Cannes, the, the night, the day that he was accepting the award, we had a team of people and an office in the Carlton Hotel looking at, so what do we do next? Now that we've gotten this thing, what do we do next? And we were looking at some very tangible, cool ideas on how to do that. And then the last one was around um, what I call a virtuous circle of creativity. If you do all those things, you, you know, if you have high, if you have a commitment and high expectations and the right leaders and the right brand, it starts attracting people. Those people start doing amazing things. That drives a business, that wins awards, that attracts more people, and it just keeps going. And, and, and so, so those are the 10. Mm -hmm. And I think all of them are meaningful today. The, 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 the one that is, I would say, new, which was kind of baked into all of them, is authenticity. I think from a communication perspective and a brand perspective that brands need to be excruciatingly authentic and true to who they are. And you'll see, you've seen that in some of the communications that brands did at the beginning in the middle of the COVID you know, pandemic. There were brands that stood up and said, here's a, a point of view. And if they were already doing that before, it felt like a natural extension yeah. So Dove, for you know, decades now with real beauty, they talked about you know, courage is real beauty. Um, and so I think you, know, you, you if you're in that space, these crises give you an opportunity to make that message even more meaningful and relevant. So authenticity, I think, is really important, and then being useful, you know. You know you know, brands need to find a way to be useful and to have people feel like they can make a difference. Um, there was a great billboard that Uber ran. I saw it just happened to be a, in New York and it said something like, um, if you're a racist, please delete our app. Um, brilliant. You know, did, how many people deleted the app? I don't know, but, but it, there was a brand taking a stand and you wouldn't have seen that four or five years ago brands stayed away from any sort of political messaging and um they're now stepping up and saying there's a vacuum you know that's what i mentioned earlier there's yeah. a vacuum in trust and brands can step into it if you step into it you need to be committed I need to step in with authenticity just because otherwise it will it will it's a house of cards will fall apart so what are you seeing what are you seeing your clients focusing on the most now given everything that has happened what are they trying to let's say beef up or <laughs> or expand on the most well it's you know had you asked me that a couple of years ago uh the answer would have been really simple which would have been digital transformation yeah, another one of those great phrases that everybody thought was going to be a real differentiator. Right. And then, well, then you ask them, you say, well, why are you doing that? Well, because we got to have digital because that's important. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I run a, a group of marketing executives. We meet three or four times a year with an organization called the Conference Board. Mm -hmm. And we were meeting um, at the Salesforce headquarters right before the pandemic started. And the focus of that meeting was on digital transformation. And we all realized that no one had a clue why this was so important. And I don't remember the person who stood up and said, well, the, the reason we're, the reason digital transformation is important is to understand the customer better. And, right. and, and so that, 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 that we get more data, more insights, more knowledge to be able to connect with that customer, you know, this whole idea of personalization to do it in a way that we haven't been able to do before. So I think, um, you know, so digital transformation, technology, data, AI, personalization, all that's, everyone has access to all the platforms, right? There's really two places to spend your advertising dollars, Google and Facebook. So everyone has access to those platforms, right? Everyone now has transformed. 
now what? Mm -hmm. and, and to me, the now what is creativity. And so what I'm hearing from clients that I'm working with is how do we get our people, back to people process precision, how do we get our people to open themselves up to be more creative, to drive more innovation? So that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is I'm hearing a lot of, we have these really smart, logical marketing people and we have these wacky, crazy, creative people. How do we get them to work better together because they're always at loggerheads? And that's been going on since you know the agency world of the account people and the creative people. Rebels and, and rulers. <laughs> rebels and rulers, right? And like, so um, that goes back to some of these principles about having a common language to be committed to, um, to training people. You know, you, you, especially, well, it's a little tough right now because we're all in, in our, our homes, but when we were still in offices, you know, you could see the people on teams that were really good at writing briefs. Like briefs are really important. That's, that's that precision, right? You can teach people to write briefs. So you can train people to write briefs. And if you don't have a good brief, you're gonna waste a ton of time and no one has it, right? So, so they're looking at ways to train their people. They're looking for ways to inspire their people because you can't just make creativity happen. There was a great ad man named Keith Reinhardt, who was one of the Mad Men ad men. Mm -hmm. and, and Keith said uh, once, he goes, you can't just kick a creative person like a vending machine, expect out to pop something magnificent. So do you have to inspire that person and support them and fuel them. And so I'm seeing from clients, like how do we fuel creativity? And some of that Flavia is simply saying, it's important that creativity is important to the company. And that gets back to your question about who's the ultimate brand person, it's the CEO. If the leadership of the company says creativity is important and you're gonna be measured on that, what do you know? Creativity becomes important and it flourishes. Hmm. I love that. I love it when somebody says the brand is the responsibility of the CEO. <laughs> it brings it brings me joy. Uh, I wish you know, more just, people would say that, <laughs> to be honest. You know, just a, a story in that when I, again, back to my McDonald's world. Um, when I first joined, um, I sat with the CFO and we were talking about the value of brands. Mm. And he gave me the best lesson. The CFO gave me, the brand guy, the best lesson I ever had on the value of brands. He said, you know, uh, Matt, if, if tomorrow all 36,000 McDonald's restaurants burnt to the ground, I could walk into any bank in the world and borrow the money to rebuild because of that brand because they know that brand is a beacon for business. Uh, oh, you know, though I left, I, thought I, have, I have nothing left to add to this conversation. That's you know, such that, a good answer. Oh it's so gosh. true. It's, yeah, it's so true. Man, I don't know if I've ever heard it. Anyways, <laughs> I'll have my moment to think about that afterwards. But, um, I think I think I think there's also uh, to your point there might also be a certain level of even large organizations maybe returning to basics a bit in light of recent events. Would you would you agree? And if so, why why do you think that is? Uh, tell me more about what you mean by getting the basics. I mean, I think that I, know I you think you have something up your sleeve, even though your sleeve is right. I know you've got something. <laughs> I just, I, I, I feel that, um, and this is what I was uh, ironically talking about when, uh, when I was speaking recently at something here, is that, you know, for, for so many years, you had this super long runway for a campaign. You know, you sat there and you thought about a project for, to your point about creativity, I think the process and the operations side is, <laughs> can really, can really kill you there. But um, you thought about for a very long time, what you wanted your next campaign to be, your next move, like you were saying. But the trajectory was 
insanely long and it was almost like you were trying to do these very big gestures it was always about these grand gestures and 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 we can talk later about what that means for things like awards and and stuff like that and, and why that was happening but i feel like in in moments of crisis like what we saw this year it's it's very similar to your relationship with other people you know i don't remember so much to be honest the grand gestures as i do the small surprising actions along the way those are the ones that stick with me the ones that were less planned the ones that were more natural the ones that were and granted for a person you know from a person to person standpoint it might be much easier because you're just one person that needs to make those decisions but as organizations the ones that really really you know were bright for me this year were the ones that were not necessarily thinking about what's the biggest thing that we can do but that were responding very quickly in very almost not not simple ways but they were they were they were almost beautiful in their simplicity of just you know saying the right thing in the right moment and not overthinking it or 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 waiting i don't know how long to to make your move um and when i hear you talking about creativity i'm sitting there thinking you know the thing that that tends to kill it is is sometimes how long you let it cook and how many people you get into that room <laughs> to do the actual cooking yeah yeah um, <laughs> Edith, that was a lot. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> um, I, th I think I've long felt that most brands are always looking for balance between those sort of big tentpole kind of ideas versus the kind of the, the everyday stuff. You know, it's balancing driving sales overnight versus building equity over time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think today in this content world, of personalization and all the tech tools that we have that you know there there's a, this constant churn of looking for ways to be more and more and more you know personal and meaningful and and that's really important because that's that, that that's a, a tangible you know impact on the business and um you know as much as we may not like the fact that google and facebook and others have all this data on us and know what we're going to be doing next sometimes before we know what we're going to be doing next it allows brands to insert themselves at just the right time with just the right message and just the right way and that's really important at the same time i think it's important to get to make a dent you know, to make to, to, to have people stand up and see that the brand is bigger than a transaction. And um, so I think it's about doing both of those. And, and I think there's some brands that are doing that exceptionally well. I mean, I get it, we're using the same ones, but um, there's a beautiful, I would say, tentpole idea that Apple executed right as the pandemic, right as all of us were being shut in they were they were being true to you know tools for creativity and showing how their tools were making life better inside of homes and it was just a beautiful story we've all seen the the pieces that google does where they are showing how you know how search is 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 a necessity today and how they play that role in a very very emotional way what's the return on that investment no idea but it, it creates that emotional connection, that charisma that inspires devotion. So I think it's about, it's about balance. And I don't know that anyone's quite got that right, but I think too much of either one, like I'll get just, again, my McDonald's experience, we, we knew that there were certain communication pieces that the return on investment was generating between 11 and $15 for every dollar that we spent. Mm -hmm. There was other that generated a return of four or five for every dollar that we spent. The difference was the four or five was overnight. The 11 to 15 was over several weeks. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want? You want both because you, you got to have yeah. the velocity, but you got to have the tail as well. So I think it's, um, it's about just getting balance. Hmm. So then can I ask you which brands you think are doing it right right now? I know you had a good. Well, I can tell you, there's some brands that I've seen that are just doing some really wonderful things. I think you know there was a. It, it's hard to get out of like I saw a commercial, but 
I saw a commercial. But that's um, okay. We shouldn't be, <laughs> we shouldn't yeah, react saw, this way to. <laughs> I saw a beautiful commercial that for Oreo. Hmm. That was a story about a lesbian couple going home and being shunned by one of the girl's father's father. And as the story unfolded, he realized that he just wanted his daughter to be in love. Super powerful. Oreo is all about, you know, togetherness, joy, powerful. Um, Burger King, um, you know, this goes to being useful. Burger King in France ran what really was just an open letter to Burger King customers, encouraging them to go to McDonald's so that McDonald's could pay their employees during the pandemic. I mean, these are arch enemies. You know, and it was a simple gesture that, you know, very consistent with what Burger King does in terms of stunts. Usually it's the other way around. Yeah. Um, I saw a beautiful um, story really by the students of Juilliard. And they did a performance of Bolero. Mm. And the purpose was to bring comfort and joy to people. And it was absolutely stunning. Um, yeah, so, but th then there's some dumb moves out there. <laughs> like when, when, the, when the pandemic started, right? Yeah. Whatever reason, people were hoarding toilet paper. At least in America, it became this, like the shelves were empty of toilet paper. On on March the twenty first, I was watching CNN and saw three commercials for Charmin. So what Charmin was doing, and it's just being tone deaf to what was happening around them. So there's some really good things going on. There's some things that are kind of kind of bonehead. I think there are some people that might say that these. You know, maybe not in the context of what happened with the crisis now, but um, but these have always these kinds of big stunts, or as some would say, or you know, even they're great ideas, but they're not so easily validated in the end. Um, so, how do you think a brand would measure work like what like what Burger King did in France, for example, or does that? Does that, even if we removed it from the context of the pandemic, I think we've seen great ideas like that maybe elsewhere, even before, but I'm wondering how you, how you measure work like that. I think it requires more creativity, the people who are doing the measurement, because many of these things, you know, the, the, the definition of innovation by definition is it hasn't been done before. So if you've never done it before, how do you know how to measure it? You know, because the standard, you know, the standard methods of measuring generally in companies are spend a dollar, get some level of understanding, some level of conversion, some level of, of, of purchase. Um, what did Burger King get back for that? Amazing engagement and goodwill. What's, what's the value of that? I don't know. Yeah. I do know that that builds a relationship, it builds trust. And, you know, it's all either you're putting coins into the trust bank or you're taking them out. So that's about building, you know, longer term equity for that brand. Um, what did it do for Uber to tell people to delete their app? Um, you know, if they, if they were a racist, I don't think it did much except create a lot of buzz. But you can rethink your metrics. We, we did a program, this is when I mentioned um, the, the thinking being done at the Carlton Hotel, mm -hmm. we were accepting our award. The idea that came out of that was um, rethinking our ads as gifts of joy. And the thought was, do, what do people love? They love gifts. They love gifts that are meaningful to them. What if we rethought our ads, not as being selling items, but being gifts of joy. Hmm. And we said, well, what if we did 
24 of these gifts of joy in 24 cities around the world over 24 hours and connected all that with social PR content, what would happen? And we said, well, how do we measure that? So we've never done something like that before. So we just, we rethought our metrics and given where the business was at the time, uh, driving, you know, shifting sentiment became the primary driver. Then all the normal ones about the engagement levels and the likes and the shares and all that were important. Um, and, and the question was, well, what's it going to do for the business? Mm -hmm. um, the answer was, this is about long-term engagement. This is about engaging people and not small thing it was about teaching an entire organization what it meant to be a 24 seven brand because we didn't have any idea of how to do that. Um, so sometimes you're investing in marketing because you're trying to drive consumer action. Sometimes you're trying to drive behaviors inside of companies. And that's a way, in essence, it becomes a, a way to train people real time. Um, yeah, there's rethinking mm -hmm. metrics. What about, what about awards shows though, in this context of really creative ideas coming out of nowhere. I think that there's quite a bit of frustration sometimes about creative work being done just for the sake of awards. And I'm wondering, given that you spearheaded or inspired 88 line wins, <laughs> I'm thinking that you have, I'm thinking you have some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, this is one of those, it's like, sounds like a joke. Uh, <laughs> an American walks into a bar in Moscow and meets a Grand Prix winner from London. And the American, me, tells the Grand Prix winner that I want to go and win awards for McDonald's. The Grand Prix winner says, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You should just do great work and the work will speak for itself and either it'll win lions or it won't. And I said to this guy, his name was Richard Russell, Richard, of course you feel that way. You already have your Grand Prix. I'm trying to inspire creative people like you because they will be able to build their career on their, those awards. And by the way, the award-winning creative that McDonald's had done at the time had a higher return on investment than our non-award-winning work. And so the pursuing awards was around elevating the quality of the work and inspiring people to want to do the best work of their lives. We, we, you got to know as a client, it doesn't matter who your agency is, you're competing for talent. Yeah. And so the, the view that we held was if the most talented people at those agencies were clamoring to get our briefs, then our work would be stronger in the marketplace. And in fact, that, that became very true. People wanted McDonald's briefs, even people didn't work on the business. And so I think if you can create an environment where people are clamoring for your briefs um, because they know they have a chance to do the best work in their lives all day long. Now, what you and I were talking about a couple of days ago is a huge problem, which is creating ads for the sole purpose of winning an award. And, and, and to meet the criteria of the award shows, you got to convince a client to go spend a couple dollars on it so that it runs someplace somewhere in the middle of the night. And they say, yes, it's a real ad and it's run. I think that's cheating. And I think it, um, it cheats the business. And you know what, it's, 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 you've mentioned it before, <laughs> to get a great, piece of advertising through a gauntlet at a big company is really hard work. Um, it's really hard work yeah. to have a side bet and say, hey, wink, wink, let's make this ad. It'll just be you and me and we'll do it and we'll run it. You know what? That's hard to do too. It's hard to get great advertising, but that's a heck of a lot easier than doing it, you know, the old fashioned way, which is, and that's, that's the unfortunate part of the business, which is why it goes back you know, my thought earlier about the three P's, people, process, precision. You gotta have the right people with the right skills and the right heart to inspire the right kind of work. 
some people are really good at that, you know, and my advice is get those people into the process. Some people are terrible at that. You can try to train them and sometimes they can get better. Sometimes they can't You gotta get those people out of the process. You know, so I, so I think, you know, it's back to my, my principles, you know, of, of, you know, it's about people, it's about relationships, it's about leadership. Um, I talk a lot about compassionate leadership and, um, you know, compassionate leaders are like that woman from Salesforce. From Salesforce, I was just thinking. You know, she knows what people do for their soul and they, she knows what they do for their salary. You know, you're compassionate leaders are the kind of people when you walk in with a problem, they're like, yep, let's hear it. Let's, let's, let's figure this problem out versus, and we've all been there, we've all walked into someone's office scared to death that we're gonna have, we're gonna say the wrong thing at the wrong point and there's gonna be a person there who's judging us versus having compassion for the ideas that we have and looking for ways to make them better. So, you know, compassionate leadership, I think is one of the most important factors in anybody who wants to drive creativity and innovation. Hmm. I think, first of all, we're getting a little bit close to the end here, which is, I wish I could, you know, kind of leave it with what you just said. But I do have to ask, did you see very big, I mean, you work both on the, on the client side, on the brand side and on the agency side. Did you see large differences in how creativity was handled or how it flourished in these environments? I mean, in one case, you have people that are living the brand every day, doing the work. In the other case, you have, you know, people that are working on multiple brands every day, perhaps. So were there large differences between the two in terms of potential results, et cetera? Yeah, I think the, um, so I, I worked at Ogilvy and May there in, in the Rubicam for a while before I moved over to Visa. And, and one of the reasons I was interested in, interested in being a client is because I didn't have enough talent to make ads. I couldn't write well enough and I couldn't art direct well enough. Hmm. And so as an account guy, I felt like I had a really important role but I was looking for a little bit more, you know, control over what actually got put out into the, the world. And when I noticed, you know, so, so when, when I moved to, to Visa, I was able to have a greater hand in that. Uh, and, and when I saw the big difference, and this was the, the hard part for me to, to make that transition was as an agency person, your job is to develop the best recommendations and the best you know rationale for those recommendations for your client mm -hmm. so so agencies often come in with what i would call is the dead right answer you don't do this mr or mrs client you're a knucklehead this is this is the best thing to do as a client your job is to do two things, is to define the problem as clearly as you can so that the agency can answer it. And then you have to decide if their recommendation is right. And, 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 and so that, that, that was the big you know, difference for me. It was one is recommending versus defining and, and approving. And I, you, know, you know, today it's all kind of blended, right? Uh, yeah. you know, the, best, the best relationships, the best work that I've ever been a part of, this is, a, you know, it's a sort of trite, but if you walked into the room when the work was being presented, you probably wouldn't know who the clients were, who the agency people were, um, because there was that strong collaboration. You know, now, and I know we're right at the, at the hour, now what's happening is you've got so many brands that are bringing the creative product, you know, the, yeah. the, the creative capability inside. Now you really can't tell because they all work for the same company. And um, there, there are some briefs in that dynamic if you're, you have an in-house agency and, and outside agencies. Some work can be done very easily by outside agencies and should go there for all sorts of reasons. Some of the, especially in the tech world, some of these products are so complex that you really have to know the product intimately. And with all due respect to every agency person that might be on this, 
there is no way an agency person will have the same intuitive knowledge of the brand and the products as the clients. It's impossible because you've got one who is living it moment to moment versus coming and going. And so there's, there's knowledge that you pick up that, you know, as much as we say you should know your business as much, your client's business as much as they do, rarely does that happen. Hmm. Well, on that lovely note, no. That was a bad note to end on, but I don't know. You should have stopped at the other question. No, I think the insights, to be honest, uh, to your point about authenticity, I think the honesty is all that matters here. And that's, that's, uh, that's what I, what I really like about, about you guys is that you've always been so open. I don't know. There's something about coming to a foreign country that you've never been to before for a small event that has just started, you know, with some, some, you know, a group of, I don't know, crazy kids that somehow brought so many of you together and you have this innate quality uh, that you all share as, as speakers that that's why we've all become family because it's just the honesty is there the sincerity is there the humility is there and for this I have to say I have to say thank you once again for joining us once more and I hope there are many many other occasions that bring us together um, I, hope, I hope this was valuable uh, I you know I always have fun talking to you so thank you I believe I believe it was, um, and I guess we shall we shall hear from others as well as we keep going through through the month. But I guess I say thank you to everyone that joined and everyone that watched as well. Matt and I really appreciate it, and definitely tune in tomorrow. Tomorrow we have yet another one, um, and tomorrow uh, we have Interbrand, so that should be interesting as well. Brand valuation. See, we were just talking about brand value, so tomorrow we're going to be diving in a little bit a little bit further. But until then, Matt, I send you. All my love and I guess to everyone else, I'll see you tomorrow. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>